Hi everyone, welcome to our third episode of Design Your Own Airplanes. For those of you who are new to the channel, in our first episode, we learned how to build this simple glider from common and expensive materials. In our second episode, we learned three aerospace engineering design principles and how to apply them to make your own glider designs. We have not, however, taken a detailed look at why these engineering concepts work. Over our next few videos, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into glider physics and learning how to make our planes fly better, farther, and longer. The first thing we're going to learn in this video is a brief explanation of vectors. Vectors are a subject that we're going to be relying on quite heavily to explain how gliders fly. Second, we're going to be learning the difference between gliders and projectiles, and why they function differently. Third, we're going to take a look at the forces acting on a glider during flight and learn how they make it fly. Finally, after we understand the basic physics of glider flight, we're going to learn the fundamental principles for making your glider fly as far as possible. To understand how gliders fly, we'll need to understand the forces acting on them. But to understand forces, we're first going to have to understand vectors. A vector is really just a fancy word for an arrow. They are used to represent quantities that have both magnitude and direction. In our case, we'll be using vectors to model the strength and direction of the forces acting on our gliders. A vector points in the direction that the force acts. The length of the vector indicates the strength of the force, with a longer vector indicating a stronger force and a shorter vector indicating a weaker force. Another property of vectors that will be important in this video is that they can be added together or broken apart to create new vectors. To add multiple vectors together, simply connect them so that the tip of one vector touches the tail of the next. The final vector can be found by drawing a new vector from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector. This means that the three yellow vectors added together are equivalent to the green vector. Now that we understand vectors, let's take a look at the difference between gliders and projectiles. First, consider a projectile, like this baseball. When a projectile is thrown, it curves downwards and accelerates towards the ground. When a glider is thrown, however, it does not curve downwards or accelerate, but instead descends in a straight line at a constant speed. This is what an ideal glider flight should look like. To understand the difference between gliders and projectiles, think of a tug of war between the forces acting on them. The main force acting on a projectile is its weight. Weight always acts in the downwards direction towards the ground. Don't consider air resistance just yet. We're going to add that in a few minutes. Because there's no other forces opposing the weight of a projectile, it curves downwards as its weight pushes it faster and faster towards the ground. If we return to our tug-of-war analogy, we'll find that, unlike a projectile, a glider does have a force pulling in the opposite direction against its weight. This force is called lift and is produced by the glider's wings. Because the weight force and the lift force acting on a glider are equally strong, the two forces are at a stalemate and neither can win the tug-of-war. This means that a glider will neither accelerate upwards nor downwards, but will instead descend at a constant speed. Now that we understand the difference between gliders and projectiles, we're going to take a closer look at the forces acting on a glider and how they make it fly. To do this, we're going to be using a free body diagram. A free body diagram is a diagram that shows all of the forces acting on an object, how strong they are, and what direction they act in. To start our free body diagram, consider a glider that is descending at a constant speed. The dashed line shows the direction it's flying. The first force we're going to add to our free body diagram is weight. As we previously mentioned, weight force always acts in the downwards direction. The second force we're going to add to our free body diagram is the lift force produced by the glider's wings. Lift force always acts at a right angle to the direction an airplane is flying. Next, we're going to break the weight force apart and replace it with two other forces. One of the new forces, shown in blue, will act in the direction of flight. This force is called thrust. The other new force, shown in yellow, will act at a right angle to the flight direction 
and in the opposite direction of the lift force. We'll refer to this force as anti-lift. We can tell that the combination of the thrust force and the anti-lift force is equivalent to the weight force because, when you connect the thrust and anti-lift vectors together, tip to tail, they start and end in the same place as the weight vector. Now we've removed the weight vector from our free body diagram and replaced it with the thrust and anti-lift vectors, but there's one more force we need to add, and that is air resistance, or drag. Drag is the force of a fluid, such as air or water, pushing back against an object that's moving through it. If you've ridden a bicycle, you might remember feeling the air pushing back against you as you ride really fast. The drag force always acts in the opposite direction than an object is moving. Our free body diagram is now finished. We can see all of the forces acting on our glider, which direction they act in, and how strong they are. Notice that the lift and anti-lift forces are equally strong because the vectors are the same length. If we remember our tug-of-war analogy, this means that our glider will not curve upwards or downwards, but will instead fly in a straight line. Similarly, the thrust and drag forces are equally strong as well. This means that the glider will not speed up or slow down along its flight path. Now that we understand the basic physics of glider flight, let's get to the good part. How to make our gliders fly as far as possible. When we throw a glider, it descends a given height while also moving a horizontal distance. The height the glider descends we will refer to as y, and the horizontal distance we will refer to as x. By taking the ratio of x to y, we can find how much horizontal distance a glider will cover for every increment of height lost. This ratio is called the glide ratio. We can use the glide ratio to find the distance a glider will fly. The horizontal distance a glider flies, which we will call x0, can be calculated by multiplying its starting altitude, which we will call y0, by the glide ratio. Of course, the obvious thing to do to make a glider fly further is to throw it from higher up. A glider that has further to descend will also travel further horizontally. Here, the glider shown in green flies further because it was launched from a greater height. Another thing to do to make a glider fly further is to increase its glide ratio. This means that it will fly further for every increment of altitude lost. Here you can see that both gliders are launched from the same height, but the one with a high glide ratio, shown in green, travels further than the one with a low glide ratio, shown in red. This is an example of a glider that has a low glide ratio. As you can see, it doesn't fly very far. This is an example of a glider that has a high glide ratio. This one flies a lot further. Now we know that to make a glider fly as far as possible, we need to maximize its glide ratio. But how do we do that? To answer that question, let's return to our free body diagram. First, let's take a look at how changing the weight of a glider affects its glide ratio. On the left is a lightweight glider, and on the right is a heavy glider. As before, the weight force has been split into thrust and anti-lift forces. When the weight force of the glider is increased, as can be seen on the right, the glide ratio actually doesn't change because all the other forces have to increase to balance it out. This means that increasing the weight of a glider actually does not change the distance that it flies. Now let's take a look at a low glide ratio and a high glide ratio and examine the differences between the two. On the left is a glider with a low glide ratio, and on the right is one with a high glide ratio. Notice that in the case of the high glide ratio on the right, the thrust and drag forces are much weaker than in the case of the low glide ratio on the left, while the lift and anti-lift forces are stronger. We can take the ratio of the strength of the lift force, which we will refer to as L, to the strength of the drag force, which we will refer to as D. This is what is called the lift-to-drag ratio. What's interesting here is that the lift-to-drag ratio is actually equal to the glide ratio. This means that the distance a glider flies, x0, can be calculated by multiplying its starting height, y0, by the lift-to-drag ratio. At this point, 
It's clear what we need to do to make our gliders fly as far as possible. To maximize our glide ratio, we need to minimize the drag force. This will make our planes fly further for every increment of altitude lost. Well, that wraps it up for this video. We've learned how to use vectors to model the forces acting on our gliders. We've learned the difference between gliders and projectiles. We've learned how the different forces acting on a glider make it fly in a straight line at a constant speed. And we've learned that to maximize the distance our gliders fly, we need to minimize the drag force. But that still leaves us with several unanswered questions. How do we minimize the drag force? How do we produce enough lift force to counteract a glider's weight? And this whole video, we've been assuming that the lift, drag, and weight forces all balance each other out. But what happens if they don't? We're going to be exploring the answers to those questions over the next few videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.